Anyways, Exodus chapter number 33 is where we're going to be today. Exodus 33. And um, I'm looking forward to today's lesson because I think that it is not only applicable to our series, but is also applicable to where we're at right now um, as far as the season goes and as far as focusing on Thanksgiving. And so today we're going to be on truth number two of our series that we started last week called Truths for Tough Times. Truths for Tough Times, which is very hard to say. Um, I'm learning that now that I've had to say it a couple of times. But Truths for Tough Times. And here's kind of the goal of this series. Sometimes when we go through something difficult, number one, it's very easy to lie to ourselves. Um, It's easy to believe something that is not actually accurate. How many of you, you're good at convincing yourself of stuff? Good at convincing my hands up, okay? I can uh, put myself in a situation. I can come up with someone. I can even sometimes, um, I hate to admit it, I can even come up with someone's motive for them. Anybody else, can, can you do that? Like someone does something and you're like, was that really a kind gesture or were they trying to get in with me? Do they think I have money? They probably think I have money, right? And so you can kind of come up with their motives for, for them. And um, sometimes it is easy to convince yourself in a difficult time, in a tough time, that something is not true. So when we think about so when we're experiencing something difficult or maybe just the day-to-day struggles, sometimes we can believe that maybe God doesn't love us. Sometimes we can believe that God is punishing us. Sometimes we can believe things like that God is not good, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so we convince ourselves, and really it's funny because something that took years and we've spent years believing can be taken away from us in just a matter of seconds. You go through something difficult, you hear bad news, you go through a tough time, and something that you have believed for 20, 25 years of your life and you've heard taught and it's been instilled in you, all of a sudden is gone believe that God is not good. You believe that maybe God is trying to, trying to work against you. You believe that God doesn't love you and he doesn't have what's best for your life and mine. And now all of a sudden you begin to operate on that lie. And so the point of this series is really just to bring us back to some very simple biblical truths that in the midst of a tough time, we can run back to and say, This is what I believe in this moment. So last week we talked about God is love, uh, God loves you, and then this week truth number two is that God is good. We're going to go to Exodus chapter number 33, begin reading in verse number 11. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you this is not going to be a stereotypical God is good lesson from this passage, okay? We're going to read a story, and then we're going to take some principles out of it and apply it, okay? I don't know that I, number one, I'm not super familiar with anyone who's necessarily spoken on this passage. I've heard a couple of sermons out of it, but I know that I've never heard anything on the goodness of God out of it. But when I read through it this week, I could not help but recognize just how applicable it is to what we're getting ready to talk about. And so we're talking about the truth that God is good out of Exodus chapter number 33. I want you to look at verse number 11. The Bible says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Which isn't that just a, like that in and of itself is a powerful phrase. That Moses and God spoke face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Can you imagine FaceTiming God? Like, can, can you imagine being so close to God that you were, it was like you were speaking to one of your best friends? That's the relationship that Moses had with God. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this and consider that this nation is thy people and he said this is god responding to moses my presence shall go with thee and i will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us up, carry us not up hence so here's what moses is saying he says i need your help i need to know who's going to help me i need to know how this is going to work And God says, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be with you. 
And Moses responds and says, if you're not going to do that, then don't even make us go that way. And sometimes in trial, let me just let me just give you just a principle out of this passage that has nothing to do with the lesson. Sometimes in trials, what we have to understand is that if God is was not going to go with us, it is not a good God who would send us into that on our own. If God's not going to go, he's not going to send you. If God's not going to help you, he's not going to put you in that situation. And so Moses says, if you're not going to come, if you're not going to be, if your presence is not going to be with us, then just don't send us at all. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So that, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also thou that uh, thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in, the, in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee by my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So the Lord does that and look at verse number six of chapter number 34. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in, what's the next word? goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth, and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. I want you to go back and look at verse number 19 of chapter number 33. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Someone finish this verse for me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Moses got to taste and see the goodness of God. Isn't it interesting? I want you to listen to this and then we'll get into the lesson. Isn't it interesting that one of the very few people who got to see God in all of His glory did not see His wrath, did not see His judgment, did not see His anger, but saw His goodness. When Moses got to see the glory of God, Moses saw God's goodness, but in chapter number 33, God even predicted what Moses would see, and he said, the abundance of my goodness. He says, Moses, you're about to not be scared of me. You're about to see how good I actually am toward you. This was in the midst of a time when the children of Israel, Moses himself says it in chapter number 34, verse 9, was a stiff-necked people. They were in sin. They weren't wanting to do what God wanted them to do. And God had every right to bring before them and to show Moses, let me show you what I'm about to do with you. Let me show you just what I have the capability and power to do. But instead, he chose to show Moses, this is who I am and I am good. I'm good to you even when you're not good to me. I'm good to you even when you are bad and not in the right. I am good to you. And so with that in mind, I want us to come to truth number two of truths for tough times, that God is good. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look into your word. Lord, I thank you for just how good of a God you are. And unfortunately, we're really good at taking the time to praise you and to thank you and to worship you over the course of the next couple of weeks. Lord, we have a 
holiday like Thanksgiving to where all of us get sentimental and we think about the good things that you've done for us. And then we have something like Christmas that kind of pulls on our heartstrings and refocuses us on you coming to this earth. But Lord, the truth is, is that you are good more than just two days out of the year. In fact, God, in all of human history, you've never woken up once and had a bad day. And so, God, I ask that you would help us to see that in good times and bad times, you are still good. Help us take this simple truth, apply it to our hearts, and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever had someone tell you that something or someone was bad? I'm going to ask you for just a second to go and recall your elementary days for just a second, okay? Some of you are like, oh my goodness, my elementary days were so scarred, okay? Just for a second. This isn't counseling, so just, just spend a couple of seconds there, all right? Well, if you go back to elementary, there's always, it seems like that no matter what kind of school you go into, some of you teachers can probably attest to this, no matter what school you go to, no matter where you go in life, there's always just that one bad, mean kid, isn't there? Sometimes there's like three or four. Sometimes there's a whole class of them, all right? But there's always that one bad, mean kid. Growing up, when my parents would travel or my dad would maybe go preach at another church, um, they didn't really give me the option to sit in a service with them. And so I went to kids' classes in other churches. And it was funny because I never went to a kids' class where there wasn't just a, like a bad kid. Like I never went to a, a kids' class. It doesn't matter if the church had six kids in it or if it had 600 kids in it. There was always going to be that one kid that the teacher was like, you need to go sit in the corner. You need to go sit with the teacher. Worker, can you come sit with them? Stop that. Stop punching so-and-so. There's all is that one kid. And so what do we automatically do? We say, that is a bad kid, right? And sometimes we might try to dress it up a little bit like, well, they just have their struggles. It's like, no, they're bad, okay? Like, they just have their moments. It's like, their moment is all of class time. Like, it, like it, if we're in here for an hour, they have 60 minutes of, of moments the whole time, all right? They're a bad kid. And why do we say that? Because we've looked at their behavior, we've looked at the way that they've lived out their life, we've looked at maybe the way they interact with others, and we have given them the title of bad. Did you know that when you look at God, you can't help but give Him the title of good? When you look at His behavior, when you look at the way that He has interacted with humanity for all of, the, all of human history, the same way that you would base a belief and a characterization off of a kid in a class and say they are bad, that is who they are, that is their character, and when they're good, then that's outside their character, right? Like, I cannot believe that so-and-so won the quiet seat prize today. That is just not who they are, right? That's outside their character. That's outside of who they are. That's outside of the normal way that they live their lives. And when you look at God, you can't help but say that He is good. But did you know that God also never has a moment that is outside of His character? God never has a moment to where He wakes up one morning, which obviously we know that He doesn't wake up, so you can already eliminate that portion of the illustration, okay? But God never has a day where He just says, oh, today's a bad day, I'm just going to be frustrated with everybody. Some of you who work in offices or you work with maybe students or you go to school, you have bad days, don't you? You don't want people to talk to you. You don't want people to interact with you. And if you see someone who's having a good day on your bad day, that's even more annoying, right? Hey, good morning. Top of the morning to you. Shut up, right? That's how we feel. But God never, never has a day where he says, oh, well, Today, I'm just going to decide to judge humanity. I'm just going to have a, a bad day. I'm just going to operate off of how I feel in this moment. No, God is always good. God is consistently good because it is who He is and He cannot operate outside of His character. Which leads us to this interesting passage as we talk about the goodness of God. Exodus 33 is one of the few moments in Scripture where we see God in all of His glory. In fact, Moses' request is, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. Show me how big and how great you actually are. Show me who you are. Show me you and all of your greatness, is what he's saying. 
And what does Moses see when God says, this is what I'm about to show you? God predicts it in verse number 19 of 33, as I've already said. He says that you're about to see the abundance of my goodness. You go to chapter number 34 after it's already occurred, and Moses says, God, this is who you are. You are good. You are kind. Which means this, that even in the midst of our bad times, God is still good. We can step back and we can say, well, God's not good because this is what's going on in my life. No, God is still good because it's outside of his character to be bad. Well, I don't understand why this sickness is occurring. I don't understand what God's trying to do in our country. I don't understand this. And here's what we've got to step back and say, is that if it's outside of God's character for it, him to do bad and to do wrong, then that must mean that the feeling that I'm having that God is not good means that I haven't figured it out yet. Means that I just haven't seen yet how good God is. And could it be that the reason we believe that God is not good, I want you to listen to this, the reason that we believe that God is not good in the midst of our tough times is because we don't actually want to experience His goodness. Moses didn't have a comfy, cushy life in this passage. The people of Israel weren't really at their peak spiritually. And yet, Moses, when he saw God, said, You are good. Meaning this, that in the midst of our tough times, we've got to find a way to step back and say, God, I want to experience just how good you are in this. I want to find your peace. I want to find your joy in the midst of this. I want to be relieved of this anxiety that I'm feeling. I want to be relieved of this discouragement that I'm experiencing because I want to experience your goodness. So I want to give you three principles and then we'll move, then we'll close. First of all is this, because God is good, he will do what is best for you. Because God is good, he will do what is best for you. I want you to look at verse, or chapter number 33, um, verse number 13. He says this, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thine sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Did you know that God could have very easily, after all of the complaints of the children of Israel, after all that they had been through, he could have said, you guys are being really difficult. I'm just going to pull myself back. I'm just not going to forget about the promised land. You guys are destined for captivity. But God withstood all of the murmuring and the complaining and the backbiting and the rejecting and the turning back and all of that. He resisted all of that to get them to the promised land because he knew what it was what was best for them. And isn't it almost humorous that sometimes the things in life that God, it almost feels like that God has to drag us through end up being what's best for us? We kick and we scream and, oh my goodness, I can't believe that this is happening. I can't believe that this, I can't believe you had them break up with me. I can't believe that they had me do this. I can't believe that this happened in my life. I can't believe that I, did, I lost this job. I can't believe I didn't get the things that we kick and scream through life the most on. We get to the other side and it's almost like that if I were God, but, but God's not childish, it's almost like that God would want to go, do you see now why I did it? Would you get over yourself for just a second and look at what I was doing? But unfortunately, we, we kick and scream so much that we almost miss out on the blessing of the journey. Can you imagine what it would be to go through something difficult or something hard and actually say, man, I don't understand it, but God, you're still good. I know you're going to work this thing out. I know you're going to do what's best for me. So I'm just going to step back and find the blessings in it. But instead, our human nature is, well, I don't want that. Well, God, why? I don't, come on. Let's just get this over with. And sometimes we want the blessing without the burden. 
And God does what is best for us because He is good. But then notice secondly, because God is good, He wants to be near you. In verse number 14, He says, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. I will tell you something that I think greatly concerns me about the generation sitting in this room is I don't know that we always know how to operate with just us and God. I think that we've become so community and social driven and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but sometimes we've become so relationship driven that we don't know how to go through something with just God. When you look through Scripture, the people in Scripture didn't have another choice. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had each other, but guess what? Daniel didn't have those three guys when he decided to pray and get thrown into the lion's den. And sometimes I feel like that this generation, what we would do is if we were in a country that declared a decree, we would have to post on social media to tell everybody, hey, we're going to defy the king's decree to not pray, so everybody get together, and guess what? If nobody showed up, well, I'm not doing it by myself. And sometimes we don't know how to go through something difficult with just God. And Moses says, who are you going to send to help me? Who are you go- who's going to run alongside me with this? Who- who's, going to be my- who's going to be my buddy? Who's going to be my friend? I can't do this on my own. And God responds not with, hey, here's the 12 people you need to lean on. Here's maybe a group that you can put together and come up with a little committee. No, he says, I and my presence am- is going to be with you. Is that enough? I want you to listen to this because I think it's important. The nearness of God is proof of the goodness of God. The nearness of God is proof of the goodness of God. A good God wouldn't send you into a tough time on your own. A good God wouldn't put you through a breakup on your own. A good God wouldn't put you through family problems on your own. And because He's good, He's near. Because He's good, He wants to walk through that valley with you. Sometimes even with you kicking and screaming. God did not look at the way that the children of Israel responded and said, I'm done with you guys, I'm out of here. Why? Because it is outside of who He is to not be good. Our little girl Baylor is probably our more scared one of the two. And what I've noticed is that when she's in a situation that she's uncomfortable with, she she wants to be close. Whether it's me or Lauren or whoever, she wants to be close. But one of the things that I was challenged with as I thought through this, and forgive me if I get choked up for just a second, is that most of the time, as a child who is scared, she initiates the the nearness. She sees that something's not right. She's experiencing fear. She's uncomfortable. And so guess what? She gets close. But God is such a good God that He initiates the nearness. That when He sees that we're in a valley or a situation or a problem, He's the one who comes close. It's our job to recognize it. It's our job to find His presence. It's our job to grab the leg of a good God and say, God, I want to be close to You. God hasn't moved. God hasn't changed. His nearness is proof of His goodness. And then lastly is this. Because God is good... He cannot do evil. I want you to look at verse number 7. Well, let's go to verse number 6 of chapter number 34. Okay? We'll close with this. I think this is so cool. Because Moses says, show me thy glory. So God does. But And it's almost funny because I think that sometimes we assume the physical glory of God. Okay? 
like, man, it, it was probably bright. It, it, was, it, was prob- it was probably loud. May- maybe it was majestic. Maybe, and, and maybe it was beautiful. And, and so we attach it to a physical attraction. We attach, attach, attach it to physical attributes. But look at what Moses says that he saw. And look at what God says. Verse number 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord... So he says who he is. The Lord God. So what attributes does he? Merciful and gracious. Long-suffering. And abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Sometimes we always want to like think, well, I wonder if the people who are guilty are going to get by with something. Not according to this verse. It will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. So what was Moses' response? And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. He worshipped. When Moses saw God, He saw him for who he really is. And the character of God means that God cannot do that which is evil. Because God is good, he cannot do evil. It is outside of who he is. Meaning this, just like when Job experienced probably the most difficult trying time in Scripture, God was still good. I was thinking about this, actually, I think this week. It might have been this morning. I can't remember. My days are all coming together, all right? In Job's life, what he was facing during the trial probably would have been a good enough excuse to say that God was not good, wouldn't it? If we were there, we probably would have already said it, okay? But then you get to the end and look at the blessing. Everything in Job's life doubled. In some some ways, it got even bigger and better than what it was before. God was not working evil against Job. In fact, if you want to get theological about it, Satan was the one who was working evil against Job. But guess what? God was still good. And in your toughest moments, it's easy to believe, God, you're not good. But the truth is, it is outside of his character to be anything but good. So what does that mean for your tough times? That means that when things are hard and things are difficult, God's still good. So get close to the good God. And run away from the thing that is scaring you. Run away from the thing that is pushing you. Run away from the fear that this world creates. Run away from the pressure that you're feeling. Run away from the stress that you're facing. And run to a good God who cannot do evil. Who wants to be near to you. And who is doing something for your own good because it's what's best for you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's pray and we'll be done.